to welcome you to another awesome day of FileMaker Training. We are going to be covering transactions today. It's very, 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 very exciting. So today is a day that we're going to be picking up the conversation of what happened yesterday, which was a, our initial conversation about the FileMaker 19.6 release, which is actually a pretty big release in the world of FileMaker. So yesterday we kind of covered all the major bullet points loosely. We didn't do any deep dives in anything. Uh, one of the big features uh, that we discussed yesterday that's in this is this idea of transactions. And transactions is like, in a lot of ways, it's like talking about the web viewer or something. It's, it's a tool that Claris put in the product. And I think that a lot of the people down there, the people that have been around the block for a while understand how big this is, but it's kind of one of those, it's like a toolbox of stuff that you can use. It has some really interesting kind of mm, rules of how it operates. It does some kind of neat things. And I think that a lot of the developers, if you go and watch people talk about this right now, they're going to, you're they're going to spend time causing your head to explode because what they do is they assume one, you already know how to build databases. Two, you already know what transactions are. And three, they're going to entertain themselves by showing you how awesome they can make a transaction run. So I, I, I'm thinking about the usual suspects, the really brilliant people in the community, the guys, the whims, the the Todds, the Davids, um, all these people are really brilliant people. And they can put on a real tour de force. What I do, what I specialize in is making sure that the rest of humanity who aren't like naturally brilliant like coders can try to keep up and make meaningful things in the FileMaker platform. That's my goal. And so if you get to become a, a Todd or a, a Wim or any sort of like really Josh Ormond, all these brilliant people, um, Chris Moyer, um, that's great. But my job is to get you kind of through the intermediate level and heading in the right way. So this conversation today is about beginners, actually for beginners and, uh, beginners and intermediate developers. I guarantee that if you haven't already investigated and figured this out um, and you're not one of these people, then I'm going to teach you things you don't know. Right. And so my goal is to give you a good concrete foundation for understanding transactions and springboard you forward on that. So that is the plan for today, what we're going to be covering. If I go to FM, you go to fmtraining.tv, you can check out the FM Training website. You can see the upcoming broadcast schedule if you hit the live training tab right here. So today is day two of a two day uh, 19.6 conversation. Next week, we continue with Nick Hunter doing complex filtering, things like that. Advanced and then uh, Friday next week, I will be here to do a kind of an open Q&A. Maybe some of the material here gets picked up there because people have questions about it. Some people will 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 miss these top miss these live streams, even though they're recorded, miss them entirely. Then Monday they'll be like, "Hey, are you going to talk about 19.6? And I'm like, uh, "Yeah." So we might have to pick it up just for the people who are um, tardies. They're tardy to class. You're going to get detention. You have to stay after school. All right. Anyway, so that's what's going on here. The upcoming broadcast schedule. If you want to support the channel, uh, come uh, come to the bundles button. Purchase one of the bundles. We greatly appreciate it. All this training is produced to you live. What I am going to do is I'm going to tell you there's some material today. I'm going to reshoot it even more precisely and crisply and make it as part of our paid video training course. It'll be animated, it'll be enhanced, it'll be better than what you can get here. The benefit of doing this live is that some of you can ask questions. I'm gonna count on Margaret and or anyone else uh, or Jacob, whoever's here to jump in and ask questions when they see questions. Let's talk about trains. I'm just gonna dive in this. I've got a pretty kick demo. I think this is really gonna help uh, most of you here. Uh, at least it helped me anyway. <laughs> so there we go. So there's a slideshow. So. I'm going to do what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little time in um, like a PowerPoint keynote, and then we're going to dump into some real neat demos. But once again, I'm going to start at the beginning. So be patient. If you already know some of this, Ruben's going to be over there like, oh, I need a beer. I need a drink. This is boring. Give me five minutes to get five, 10 minutes, to get everyone caught up to where you're at. Then we'll go forward. Right. So that's the plan. I need to remind everyone an important element of this conversation, like the critical thing to understand is this idea of record locking. And so before you can understand transactions, you have to understand record lock. I know a bunch of you understand this. Just bear with me. I'm going to try to get everyone up to speed. So the FileMaker Claire solutions that we're using are hosted on a server, a FileMaker server, Claire server, cloud server, whatever. They're on a an official filemaker -y kind of server in a multi-user environment, which means multiple users can log in the solution at the same time. The rule with the way databases work, at least FileMaker works, and it's largely analogous to SQL and other systems like that, all the users can read the records of information at the same time. So if you have a contact solution, and we all look up Brutterman, 
which is this cat that's watching me on Discord. Okay, Brotherman the cat. We look up. We look up this cat, and we could all. 100 of us or 200 or 500 simultaneous users could log into the context database and see Brutterman the cat. We can all read the record at one time. Someone determines that we spelled Brutterman wrong. They want to edit the record. So while everyone can view the data at one time, only one person can edit that record. And so the process of them asking to edit the record, they're going to try to edit the record. It causes an instantaneous and visible request to go from their client to the server and says, hey, this user would like to edit the record. The servers make sure that no one else is editing the record, and then they give that per person permission to do the edit. So the user, the terminology, two couple important terms here, they have opened the record, which means they've opened it to edit it. Remember, this isn't viewing, this is editing. Everyone can view it. It's two separate things. Viewing and editing are two separate things. Only one person can edit at a time. Once you click out of the record or you flip to the next record or you change layouts or something, then that record, the data is taken from the user, saved to the server. The server distributes that updated information to everyone in real time, right? And then the record is unlocked it's released so that person no longer has the edit control of it so that means someone else could then edit it at that point right makes sense so everyone can view the record at the same time only one person can edit once a person completes the edit they the data is committed is another word we use committed or saved to the server it says it's great and then it distributes the updated information to everyone who's looking at it Right. That's what FileMaker server is so great. It does this all automatically for us. The rub is as we become a beginning and intermediate developer, we have to kind of know some of these rules of how it works, why it works. As an end user, you don't care. It just works. This works, man. This works. But if you want to actually understand how and why it works so you can take advantage of it, that's what this conversation is about. So once again, the person's opened the record. So an opened record is one where a user has the ability to edit it. Everyone else can still see it, but they cannot and can edit a time. The server has locked the record for everyone else. So it's called a record lock. The record is locked. Okay. No one else can edit. Only the one person can edit it. Okay. That lock is exclusive to the one person. Right. So I beat this one pretty good. We're all good on this. Right. So moving forward, this is the video from yesterday. I'm going to move myself out of the way here real quick. So this is a reminder of what we're dealing with. So there's your FileMaker server. Data is updating back and forth to these users right here. Okay. All these users can also can see any sets of data. They can all view the same data, but only one of them at one time can edit an individual record. Each each of these each of these people could be doing their own edits right now. If that makes sense, they could each be doing their own edit on different records. So three people could be editing three different records. That's fine, but those three people cannot edit the same record. Okay. There is a uh, question, but it's kind of off topic. I figured I'd ask you at the end. We uh, so there's a question of, uh, from Michelle Gravel about performance. Uh, I have not validated any performance in information yesterday. I did mention that we we're going to let Hansa from 24U, kind of our performance uh, guy, person in the community. It's his company likes to do this. They have performance testing tools. I am sure he will provide performance testing data at some point when he is. We'll bring him back to the show. I don't have any uh, anything like that running. I can tell you that. I got to the point where we could put three or 400 people simultaneously into starting point and have them bang away on it without running, crashing down the server. And that was like three or four years ago, at which point I decided that FileMaker more than exceeded anything I needed to do. If I needed more than two or 300 people at a time, I would set up another server and replicate the server. We have a whole five-day conversation that we've done recorded on that. So um, when Hansa comes up with updated performance information, I will simply say that it seems that FileMaker server under some situations is faster. That's what I've been heard from multiple sources. Leaving the performance conversation aside, we've talked about record locking, opening records, that kind of thing. So the next idea, so this is now the new material right here. A database must be uh, must be the source of truth. It must be trusted. And so, which means that the information in the database must be accurate. The database should not lie to you. Business, I will, these are all the statements I'm making. Some business processes that you do with FileMaker are more critical or less critical. For example, if someone calls you and they request some information about a product you have or a service you have, and you mail them back about that product or service, you might, if you're really a diligent person, make a note in their CRM, their contact record, that they contact you about that product or service. If that bit of data were somehow lost and never seen from again, that's not the end of the world, right? However, 
if you had an invoice, that's a financial transaction. If you had some sort of accounting transactions that are going on, if you if the data in FileMaker is not accurate, then that can cause all sorts of problems, uh, regulatory issues, people not trusting a database. If they don't trust it, they won't use it. They'll use Post-it notes or whatever, right? So um, the idea is that you're going to get into some areas, especially that have to do with legal items, things that have to do with money. Things have to do with HR, which is another way of saying money and legal. All HR is money and legal rolled into one kind of nasty kind of corner of the company. Most people would rather not ever have to deal with it. So this gets to this idea of a transaction. A database transaction, by definition, must be atomic, not nuclear weapons. It must be the idea that it's an all or nothing kind of uh, thing. So if I – we talked about this yesterday, and I, I gave some people kind of the wrong idea, but let me just loosely use this. So you have a staff person that is typing data into an invoice, okay? Um, and they get halfway through putting the invoice in and file the keyboard. We've actually had one customer do that, right, um, with one of my engineers on the phone. I'm not sure what my engineer said. It did happen. And so as a result of that, that record would never be fully put into the computer Yet, if you're just entering it in FileMaker and you enter as you go, it could be saving as you go. Most likely, that's how most FileMaker things work. It kind of saves as you go. And if the person doesn't complete the process, it's not like final, final, finished. You actually might have had a transaction for $2,301. Um, and so your invoice says $1,219. It's not accurate. Yet, if you go to the bank and do an audit, the numbers don't match. So that's kind of the problem. So the idea is that a transaction is going to allow us to have kind of fault tolerant data entry per se. Data entry is the wrong word. Fault tolerant. Well, it is kind of data entry. Um, fault tolerant data input into a computer or editing into your database. The idea is that it's all or nothing. So you'd put the invoice in. It would be all or nothing. Um, now, there's been ways of doing this previously in the world of FileMaker. Um uh, Todd and John Sindler, Todd Geis and John Sindler, uh, kind of notoriously famous for doing these transactions, but to do in FileMaker took some really black magic, nasty. You had to you had to kill a unicorn and spread its blood over a campfire, and then and then you get transactions working FileMaker. Um, with end user data entry, it's a little bit easier. You can create a bunch of global fields if you want have the user input all the data into global fields. And then when that user is finally completed and done, that runs a quick script that grabs all that data and sets it where it needs to set it. Now, it still could fail in the middle of that script running, but the idea is that if you had the user just putting data into globals, then remember global fields are not really saved or stored until we decide with the script that we're gonna save or store them, right? So if someone asked the question yesterday, do, do, is the new commit system going to be useful for data, direct data entry? And generally it's not, right? And I'm, we're going to demonstrate all this momentarily. So here are transactions, okay? So transactions um, have been enabled by default. Um, uh, that's kind of a misleading term. I might remove that from my text. Uh, provide the ability to group related operations together. So the idea is that you can create multiple records, edit multiple records, delete multiple records at, in, inside a transaction. So there'll be a new command, which is called open transaction. And then there's going to be a commit transaction, right? Really the two ones that you have to memorize immediately. And so the open one starts it in the process of, 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 of collecting the data, but not saving it to the server, not saving it. I'm just going to use the word FileMaker to the FileMaker server. Um, and so it's collecting it locally until the point which you see a script step called commit transaction. And at the commit transaction point, it instead of it like going along and saving as it goes, right? Even if you put little commits in there, it's not going to do it. When you get to the commit transaction, it rolls it all up into a single like package, like a single gift in a, bow wrapping or whatever, like a birthday gift in one box, right? And shoots it to the FileMaker server. And this FileMaker server will take it all and process it all completely. Or if there's an error, it will abort all of it. So it's an all or nothing. And it's not going to get some of the data entered. You're going to get all of it or none of it. And we have the ability to trap and review that. So um, so uh, let's talk about a couple basic uh, notes right here. So notes. Um, for whatever reason, uh, if you want to stick a, tra a, a transaction in a transaction like you have, remember like an open and a commit is like a if 
and an end if in, in scripting, like it indents, right? Like if, if a bunch of stuff, then do this stuff inside, then end if, and it kind of indents back. That's how open uh, transaction and commit transaction work, right? So you really can't, it, FileMaker Claris Incorporated doesn't, did not program it so you could do transactions in transactions. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, while the, you're in the open state of the transaction, a script must be running. Okay, I'm going to say that that's an important, subtle thing, right? So, so you can't open a transaction, then let go to like a mode where the user can interact with it and then commit it. It doesn't work that way. It works by a script running continuously. If the script stops for some reason and never gets to commit, it will roll back and abort, right? So it's very, very important. So inside the open start, like really start transaction and in transaction, it's called open and commit open up, start up, and then commit is save it all, right? If it runs into a problem in there in the middle, it's going to eject, and we're going to demonstrate that here momentarily. Uh, there are two different kinds of terminology here, and we'll get this in a little bit. There is a auto-abort. Now, Claris Engineering calls it auto-abort. The marketing folks at Claris might have gotten and boogered up the terminology, uh, but I'm, we're going to discuss it today because it was, it was trained to me as being called auto-abort. Auto-abort would imply not manual abort, right? Automatic and manual control, right? Automatic is something that Claris is going to do. If it finds a reason that the, the transaction cannot continue, it will eject on its own. It will auto abort. You cannot stop this, okay? Um, you can also then manually abort, but they call that revert. There's a revert. So this is it right here. So you have a transaction can fail because of an auto abort, that's Claire's terminology, or it can be manually reverted. So really you have auto abort and manual abort, but for the, but there's actually a command there that you're going to call to do it manually. It's called the revert command. So you have auto abort, which you cannot stop. If it, if it, if it gets stinky and smelly and Claire's doesn't like what's happening, it will eject or auto abort on its own. And you can trap for that. Um, so let me go back here real quick. In the event that you're in the middle of an open transaction and, and, and you haven't got the commit, commit yet um, and you run a truncate table truncate table is like a really fast blow up a table and it just zeros out all the day in the table it's an interesting command we're not gonna spend much time on it um there's does it won't roll that back so just keep that in mind it, it, if you delete a record or delete a found set it will roll that back it will not roll back a truncate um here's some notes right here import you can run an import to a degree uh as part of your commit um, it'll suppress the dialogue. If you do any of these things right here, if you pot, try to open a managed database, you know, all these things that you would never think to do, save a copy, re-log in, close a file, um, or change the layout, et cetera, anything that's going to cause it to get excited, it's going to want to auto-abort, okay? Um, so we talked about this, auto-abort and manual revert. So no. So there's the first question. We're going to get to that momentarily, Ruben. Just hold that question. We're going to get to it. Uh, we're literally going to get to that. So these are the things that will cause an, an auto abort uh, effectively to fire. Um, I don't know if this chart has been made available to the public at large yet, but at least you're going to get it right here. So um, if you try to, if you try to, the short version is if you try to edit a record and you can't, because you don't have privileges or the record's locked by someone else or something like that, it's going to abort. If you try to, if you don't have uh, permissions to write to a field or write to a record, or you're trying to go somewhere where you can't, um, it will trigger an auto abort. Um, field validations, right? You can run into auto aborts there with these items right here. Um, so, so that's kind of this idea that once again, we will make this chart available. Margaret can post it. Margaret, you have access to the chart. Just see if you can copy and paste it for everyone while we're doing this. Okay. So I'm going to, I think we're kind of, oh, a couple more slides here. So while we're in, it's a new get function, get transaction state, right? This will tell you whether the machine you are on is, do, is in the middle of a transaction or not. It doesn't tell you whether another machine on the network is in a transaction. I want to point that out. Okay. It's, it's only specific to the machine you're on, okay? Because in the moment here, we're going to see two clients banging away on the same table simultaneously on my screen here at one time. And so one will be the user doing the editing. The other user will be largely a peripheral user that might interfere with the process. That's what we're going to look at. So we got revert co commit. Is this revert script step? 
Um, basically, it, it's revert if, and then you provide a, a Boolean uh, calculation. So if one equals one is always true, that would cause it to revert. You'll see that. Um, and then there are a couple new uh, error capture, uh, error scripting, um, error. Well, you'll see how this works. But you have git last error. Then you have git last error detail and git last error location. Um, I think you got to play with these to really appreciate them. But it will actually tell you where the error occurred in what script on what line number. So uh, very happy about that. So I think that is the end of the slideshow at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump us into a real, 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 real. I'm going to kind of like micro Richard here. So I'm going to make Richard very small. So what this is, is a FileMaker file. These are hosted. It's hosted. These are, this. Is, okay, back up. This is FileMaker 19.6 over here. This is FileMaker, in this case, 19.4 over here. Yesterday I was playing this with 19.5. It's just uh, what do you have to do is you have to have two copies of FileMaker running on the computer simultaneously. And with a Macintosh, I can do this pretty easily. They're both logged into the same file on the same server. We're on the same layout. This is a, a sample uh, starter solution. And the idea is that this one over here, we're going to run through some scenarios here and talk about this. And uh, just watch the results over here. So this is the equivalent of another user on your network but I put both on the screen at the same time so you can see what they're gonna see. First off, I'm gonna point out, I've done a couple things here. Um, these green indicators right here will indicate if the record is currently in a locked state. It doesn't tell you who's locked it, it just tells you that it's locked. To get this to work was a bit of a hack. I'm not gonna discuss how this works. I will simply say that these little green indicators only illuminate after I run a script to evaluate them, okay? So if I come over here, and I, and I start editing Samantha right here. Right now, I've clicked into a field. I'm not editing it yet. If I type a character with my finger on the keyboard, I'm going to press A for another Samantha. It's going to go to the server. It says, hey, can, can this computer over here edit this, right? And is it locked by anyone else? No, it's locked. You're allowed to edit. So if I press the letter A and there's a little bit of a pause, that's the delay in the FileMaker, uh, FileMaker server going, are you cleared to do this yes or not. So I'm going to press the letter A, one, two, three, press. Oh, it's locked over here. Okay. So let me lock it over here. I'm going to see it's locked, right? You see the error message. So now I'm going to come over here, try it again. One, two, three, A. Uh, hello. There we go. Sorry. So we can run into each other's error. So now I've got it. I'm editing it right here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this script over here. It's called check for record locks. It's going to run through a list, uh, run through a script. It's going to go through all these over here on the left. And then there'll be a flash and a refresh. And it shows that this one record is locked. Okay. Now, normally in FileMaker, if I make an edit right here, I make a click, make an edit and I click out. And then I go to another record and I make an edit. That was a, a lock and a release. As I jump from record to record, it was a lock, then it's released now. So if I click, I run my update again over here, press it one, two, three on the left side, it's gonna show that that record is released, right? Makes sense how that works. So I have to press this over here to get an update, which is kind of great. Um, all right, so I'm gonna come back to this record right here. All right, step by step by step. So. First scenario, first scenario, I'm going to pop up the scripts. We're going to look at this. We want to edit, uh, create a new record and do some edits across multiple um, multiple records. Now, these could be record. One, one of you just asked this question, multiple records in multiple tables. You want the, the defining criteria is that you have to do all the work in the layout. So once you start the uh, open uh start or open uh, transaction, I think it's open transaction, then you have to stay in that window, right? If you try to do stuff in another window, that won't be included in the transaction. In fact, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these four scenarios, then I'm going to answer the questions that you throw at me, right? So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to show us a script. I'm going to use a keyboard shortcut. I'm going to pop up here. I've got, uh, this is the reset. Uh, this script right here is the one that loops, and it's just checking to see if the record is locked, and it makes a little graphical indicator. You can't do this with a calculation field because it won't know that it has to update, right? So I have a script that literally, as dumb as this is, loops through a found set of 20 records. Um, I'm gonna, We're going to be doing some data editing here, kind of cookie-cutter data editing. This allows me to reset my data so I can run this over and over and over and over again with you. So the first demo. Okay, we're going to go to a layout, right? 
So real quick right here, you've got this. We're going to go to a layout. We started a record, so we know we're setting our context. I'm going to set my error capture at the end. I'm going to reset it. Um, I'm going to turn error capture on because it's interesting. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new record right here. This is a Andy LaCase, works for Clarice International. And then I'm going to make some edits to some existing records. Uh, I'm going to pause at the end so you can kind of take a breath and see what's going on. Then I'm going to commit the transaction. I can jump on other records in other tables as long as I stay within the layout. I don't jump to another layout, right? Uh, correction, another window. I can jump to other layouts. I cannot jump to another window. So your window, you're confined to a window. That makes sense. Um, maybe the window is hidden or not. I haven't tried that. I'm assuming that works. No one said anything about that one way or another. So this is kind of what this script does. So I'm going to go ahead and close that. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to run through it with a script debugger. And I'm going to start the script. So I'm going to press the button right here. Everything looks good. Press the button right here. I'm going to step through here. Set the contacts, clear the global down there on the right, turn error capture on because it's interesting. Create a new record. So the transaction started on this window here. Create a new record. See the screen flash? Set Andu, set Lakay, set Claris International. Notice that we're down here in a new record, right? Notice that if I come over here, that record, I'm kind of in the way, isn't down here. Does not exist. Okay. Come back over here. Okay. Step through some more. Now I'm going to go to record number one, and I'm going to add a red number one so you can see the edit. See the red edit right there, the one, right? Pretty cool. I'm going to go uh, to another record. I'm going to set another number. Now I'm going to go to another record and make another edit. And then I'm going to pause the action, okay? And so we have a pause state over here. I'm going to come over here and notice that nothing is updated yet. Oh, is it? Is it updated? No. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to check for record locks. And this is a really big deal right here. This is why I built this demo the way I built it, so you could see visually what's happened. You can't see this under the hood. I've never seen this demoed before like this, but I'm doing it for you. It's basic. So as we step through things, the, the computer on the right needed to make an edit. So it requested, <clears throat> it requested the lock and got the lock. Once, it, but it can request multiple locks across multiple tables. So any of these red ones over here are locked. If I try to click in here on on this person right here, Tricia, and I try to edit her, can't. So this one process over here has locked up these three records. Notice the new record isn't over here yet. Andy Lacates is not down here. So this is cool. Now automatically you start to see. Well, this is really great, but if I edited every record in the table in a in a transaction, then you'd lock the whole file up and no one could make any edits. So there's this kind of natural downside to, to doing this, right? I mean, just because you have a shiny new tool doesn't mean you should use it, right? Right? It's it's a tool. It's another tool in the toolbox, right? Right? It, it's like a hammer. And you got a nice shiny hammer that Clarice gave you. Now you're going to beat the out of everything with your hammer. So... Please don't put everything in transactions. Transactions should be used selectively where you really need to ensure that it all happens because it's important, like a financial record, right? And so it's paused up here. Notice that I actually can't do any editing up here. I, I can't really do edits. The script's running. I can't really do edits up here. I'm going to hit continue. And what happens is, is I come back over to the script debugger. It's now on commit, okay? Now on commit, it hasn't run it yet. It's what's going to run next. That's the way that works. When it, when you're in the script debugger, the line that you see will be the next command it runs. So if I hit press here, it's going to roll all this up. If there's no errors, it's going to send to the server. It's going to um, save the changes, and it should release the locks uh, over here, right? So I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to step. Boom. I, I have I have noticed now I've been updated with the edits here, and we have Andy Lacates down here at the very bottom of this. And if I ask the computer over here, hey, would you check for record locks? It's going to go, oh, I'm doing this for your benefit. I don't recommend you do this in real life, but visually it helps you understand what's going on. Then I can capture the error, but the error was, there was, the error was no, zero. So it's an error from commit. No error has occurred and we just save it. We're done. Okay. Pretty cool. Uh, question ahead. from Stu. What happens if you commit records request before commit transactions? Is that even a thing? Shall we try it together, Stu? I'm going to go to scripts. And for, uh, not now, being stupid. Click on here, go to scripts. Script number one. 
Um, there's a pause in here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute a commit right here. How about we do that together? The best the best kind of is uh, is playing with like this. Commit record request. I'm, I'm my understanding. I haven't tested every scenario on this, but this is supposed to ignore this, right? Save it. Close it. Close it. I hit the button to reset the data. So all that and, and delete it, even delete any of the case. I'm going to run the script debugger again. We can watch it in real time. Script debugger. Start. Okay, here we go. I'm going to kind of fast forward through stuff. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, right here. Now, um, if I look over here, remember it's Samantha 1 with red and stuff. I'm not going to bother updating the little green things over here because they're locked up. We know they're locked up. I'm going to go ahead and run the next step. We'll see what happens. Okay. Ah, nothing. So you can, so it will ignore all the normal things that you would cause it to normally commit. Like you changing a record would cause it to commit, right? If you think about it, right, in scripts, when I change record right here, I do an edit right here, I change the record. That is a, that's an implied commit that's in there. It's implied. It's in there, Stu, right? If I change a layout, that's an implied commit. As long as I stay in the same window, I'm good. Because really, when you pop a window in the FileMaker, it's almost like its own little session, right? It has its own context, right? We tell people, you know, what's your found set? Where, where are you at? What's your found set, sort state? What field are you on? Things like that. That's your context. The context is, is independently wrapped around each window, right? I have two copies of FileMaker running in here. They have their own context, but each additional window I pop up would really have its own context separate, right? I can sort one window one way with a found set, be on the same layout in another window and sort it and display it differently. So this is really cool. So the open transaction and the uh, commit transaction basically shut off all the implied or overt commits that you do in there. Okay. Okay. I have there a go. question above that. Is it a good idea to start a layout with open transaction, update the table with a button and open transaction mode again with same button? We will get to that. I think it's you're talking about user manual entry, and really you can't do that. Um, there's a there's a guy, um, Misha, Micah, I can't remember, gentleman I met before on the on the Claris forum who built a functional demo of doing end user interaction inside a transaction, and it's like a really nasty hack, like beyond nasty. It's something that I would never show you how to do, and I wouldn't even want to use it, but. Um, basically, the transactions are not designed for end user intervention in between the goalposts, right? The, the football goal, American football goalposts, right? The two gold things, and you have to put the ball through the middle. One's a start the transaction, one's the end of the transaction. In between there, they don't want you, there's not really intended for there to be end user intervention in there, maybe with the exception of a uh, custom, dial, uh, custom dialogue choice or something like that. Um, the way he got to work was a real hack, and we can talk about it if you want, but it's, I think we're off in the weeds on that. So I'm going to reset the date over here. We reset. We're back to normal. I'm going to run demo number two. So this is the auto abort. So what this is not a – this is where Claire, where FileMaker sees there's a problem. It cannot guarantee the, 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 the consistency of the transaction. So it's going to auto abort. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the script right here. It says, please go to the other client and start editing Samantha. Yeah, I was paused over here. My bad. I'm very sorry about that. All right, I've straightened it out now. I have a pause over here. Margaret, feel free to yell at me. I've got a pause. I have a pause, but a lot of times when you have a pause, you don't even notice it up here. Oh, yep. Yep, so I'm being stupid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start. I'm going to start editing over here. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to say run the auto abort, okay? What I'm going to do, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to come over here with the script debugger on. Okay, we're going to watch this. I got to make sure I do this in the correct order. All right, so I'm going to say, hey, you want to do it? It's going to run, and it's going to throw a dialogue, say, remind you to lock the other record. So here's what we're going to walk through. Okay, you ready? So, so far over here, nothing's been done yet. This is the previous uh, error message. It's about to be reset. Now it's reset. So error capture on, as if that matters. Okay, open uh, transaction. Set error capture on. Comes down. And he creates new record. Yep. Andy locates. No problem. Clarice International. Go to record number one, which happens to be Samantha. Okay. Step down. 
Okay, it's on record one. Now it's going to attempt to edit. In the in the attempt to edit, it's going to request to the server that it can lock open the record and lock it to everyone else. It's going to get an error message automatically. This is the auto abort. Press the play button one more click, and it jumped automatically down here to close trans uh, commit transaction because it's failed. It's going to auto eject. It's done, and it collects uh, quite a bit of telemetry in the error handling here. What I'm going to do down here is I'm going to step down a little farther. There are three uh, Git functions that have to do with errors. I have Git last error, Git last error detail, which I'm going to put in red just to separate it, and Git last error location. The reason I do all three of these in one is because you only get one shot to capture the errors. you got to capture all three of them together and then kind of parse them apart if you want. So I'm going to go ahead and capture that like that. I'm going to save it into this visual field right here. Go to record number one and exit. So what it shows is that there was an error 301. This is a lock synchronization error. That means that this computer tried to get into a record and it could. It's a lock sync error 301. Then the error location is this script right here, right? This script right here. This is the command. And on line 20 of that script, uh, that's where you're at. Normally, when I build big CRMs and things like that, I number all my scripts. So you would actually see, if you followed my method of doing stuff, you'd see some script number like this. And so you'd know that you'd have error 301. There's the script number that has the problem. There's the line number that has a problem. And these are the details down here in the different color. Okay. And this shows where the, the commit transaction was, was right there. That's where it tried to, you know, had to exit to that spot. So this is pretty cool stuff. Records with a portal. As I add records in a the portal, they cause a commit, which I don't want until done. Okay, so if you if you put the portal into that window, you can do this without records being committed. Assuming the, that, that it can get the lock on the record, right? Clearly down here at the bottom, it did the abort, right? Remember, it created an the case. It did all these edits or did edits, but then it rolled it back because it couldn't complete. Right. Uh, will transaction prevent parole? Because the, yes, the answer is yeah. Whatever goes in the window, right? So if I pop the script right here, um, and I go back to like this basic one right here, anything. These are the two goalposts. Any, anything between the goalposts is fair, largely, as long as you stay inside the window. Okay. So I don't. I don't jump to another table. I could. I could jump to another table, edit some things, jump to a, a layout with, uh, well, you're jumping to other layouts, but you're jumping to other layouts, which might have a context to another table or a portal. As long as you can get the record uh, lock in there, if it can't edit the data because someone else has locked it, then it's going to eject, which is what you want. That's the whole point. If this was, but if this was Andy LeCay's received $5,000 in hard cash today in a brand new car, and then at a halfway aborts and you only have Andy without the money in there, that would be a huge deal. That would be absolutely a huge deal. That's a financial uh, record error, error editing moment, right? Makes sense. Uh, kind of related. We had a question from Twitch. Is a card considered a new window? A card is people were playing with cards on that. I don't know off the top of my head. Technically it is a card is a window. Right, because you define it as a window, it just happens to superimpose itself. So, yeah, so if you pop a card, remember there's certain restrictions with cards. You can't just be careful with cards. You can like anything else, you want to test it. A card is a window that's superimposed on top of uh, another window. Right. So, just for fun, shall we try to see what happens here? I'm going to duplicate this. We're going to call it uh, scenario five. We're going to edit this. We'll just play with this a little bit just for fun. Cause I, I didn't build, you know, I didn't know which way you folks would ask the questions. Uh, go to another layout and edit and come back. Right. So what we're going to do right here is I'm going to remove the po uh, pause. Cause we really don't need it. I'm going to save that. I'm going to make sure that I can, uh, how come I need to be able to see the, there it is right there. I need to see uh, option five right there. Okay, good. So then what I want to do is I'm going to create any locates and then I'm going to edit the first record. Then instead of this middle section right here, we're going to say, uh, go to layout. I don't know. Is there another layout here? We have another layout. layout? Do we have another layout? Yeah, it's a table called indicators, right? Go there, uh, create a new record. Why not? 
I'll just do that. I'll put a new record there to create a new indicator at this other layout. It's not even related or may, may or may not be related. It doesn't particularly matter. Then I'm going to go back to the layout over here, which where we were at. I'm going to go to original layout. Uh, how about I go to, to the back to the member detail page, right? There we go. Save. Okay. So there we go. Save, close, close. Okay. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to attempt it to tell it to run number five. So here we go. Bang, bang. I'm doing this cold, folks. So anything could happen. Okay. New record, Andy. Bam, bam, bam. He goes in there. Okay. We're going to go to record number one. Uh oh. Hang on. I'm a, I just clicked out and unlocked it just in the nick of time. Woo. Okay. Go to record number one. Go to Samantha. Add some information. Didn't fail. Go to a different layout. Hey, there we go. Uh, so here's another layout over here. Step down, add a new record request down there. Okay. Now notice I'm in the same window, I'm in the same window. Okay. Step down. We're back where we were. Go to record request four, make an edit, commit. Nothing happens. Notice over here, nothing happens. Okay. Go ahead and finish it off. I'm just going to play and close. This updates over here. We've got Andy Lacades at the bottom, I'm pretty sure. And if I go over to indicators, there's that blank record right there. So yeah, so we're as long as you stay within that window, you can get away with murder just about. What's the question? Uh, okay. We got people. The asking, next so question is going to be from David. Um, meant to open transaction at layout. Enter script trigger question mark after a commit. Open transaction again. I, I don't understand what you're trying to uh, do, David. Right? This isn't for user manual entry. This is for you as you as you have a script that does stuff. Right? You have a script that does stuff. You have a script that does stuff. And you want all those edits to be like locked in and totally good. And then you push them all to the server at one time. That way, in case the network crashes, the computer crashes, whatever happens, it's all or nothing, right? This question is from NJ. Inside transaction, would a found count or get record count show the transaction values or pre-transaction values, i.e. zero records, new transaction, get record count, and transaction, would the record count show zero or one? It's gonna it's it, it's a it's it's its own little uh its own little world, right? So it should for as far as it's concerned, that's a good question. You're asking if that new record counts as a living uh, living record. Is that what we're saying? I guess that's the question. Related um, in the form of find within a transaction, the find results will be pre-transaction from Andy. Yeah, Lewis. yeah, you're inside a transaction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Andy's Andy said that really correctly. Um yeah, no, absolutely. So you're in the transaction. Unless you give the auto abort a reason to eject, you're still in the transaction, which leads us to the next demo here I'm going to do real quick, which is kind of interesting. So remember, we had the auto abort. Then there's the manual. I put the word manual revert in here because that way it's the opposite of auto, right? It's not a yeah, right. Makes sense. So I'm going to step through this real quick. I'm going to make sure I'm going to just for fun, I'm going to reset this, get rid of Andy. Andy's gone and the red data is gone too. Okay. So script debugger. Here we go. One, two, three. We're going to do the manual revert command. Okay. And, and you'll see this actually occur. So step through. You're going down. You reset. Everything's going great. Say that you're uh, Larry. Larry works with minor league baseball. And he's doing a database that manages that. And he, he's going down here. And there's two revert commands right here. Um, I'll, I'll comment, talk about the, the commented one out here in a second. But the revert command is essentially an if statement. In this case, I said if one equals one, which is a guaranteed eject. Okay. But you could say if Andy is the record or if any condition exists, then you're going to revert, okay? And what you get to do is you get to pass in a couple parameters. One is your own custom error code. The custom error code has to be between 5,000 and 5,499, okay? If you keep it within that range, it will accept your error information and pass this information back. And in, in this case, Kermit the Frog manual revert. I did this for all the frog people. So I'm going to step through this. When I do this, it's going to, where is it going to jump? It's going to jump to the commit transaction step right there. And then it's going to pass the data right here. Error 5001 Kermit the Frog manual revert. Okay. And then what we do is we capture that real quick. The script ends. So over here we have script. It was our error number. We could pick any error number we wanted. We picked 5001. Um, and then it's telling us that it, uh, 
this is the script name right here. That is the command. That's the line of code where it uh, occurred. Then this is our custom message uh, message at the end of that. This is the the custom uh, message, right? And then we have uh, the last one details. Um, once again, the commit is right there. So yeah, I I think you could do a whole uh, session on just better management of these error messages in here. Uh, um, not complaint clear. So I'm saying for us as developers to learn from this, because I've never really used a lot of the fancy new get last error stuff like that until today I had to, right? As I was building this demo over the last week or so. So pretty neat, pretty neat. So you could, that was the, so the auto abort, if you trip, you can't suppress that. I've tried like with air capture on to suppress that, right? You cannot suppress the auto abort. It's like, like hands up, don't shoot, you know, kind of thing. Someone's got a gun point at you. You cannot override that. You got to go with what, what that, what it, it's going to do what it wants to do. You don't have a choice in that. Um, but you can detect it because when it fails, it will give you the 301 or whatever error code that caused that to uh, fail. Make sense? Open transactions can be opened only inside a script after the script ends, the transaction mode ends? Question mark. Yeah. So, so let's, 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 um, after the script ends, <laughs> I've never like written one where nothing ever happened. I guess we could try that again. So let's do that. We'll go to scripts. Uh, I'm going to go to the, to the um, I'm going to simple, let's make this number six here. This is going to be uh, six. We're going to simulate incomplete, complete uh, transaction. So this is just, it's just going to get to the end and nothing important. Happens. I'm not going to change any layouts right here. I'm going to get rid of that. And then we're just going to like, oh, I don't think it'll let you, huh. Okay, if I do it like this and try to save this script, it's not going to let me because it can't, it knows that it has to be a matching balance on here, right? So you have to put the commit on here, commit transaction to even allow you to save it, okay? And then if, but if you're over here and you said, I'll, I'll uh, put it, I'll put it right here. I'll put an exit script and we could even try a halt if you wanted to save it, close it, close script debugger, script debugger on over here. Do I need to reset the data? No, I don't. Okay. So I'm going to manually run scenario six. Here we go. Step, step, reset the error capture. Perfect. On air on. I don't think that'll matter. New record. Andy LeCage, Claris International. And I'm pretty, you see him right there behind the screen. Step down, set the first record. Okay, here we go. So as you can tell, I'm going to come over here. I'm just going to run this auto locky thing. Check. It's checking for auto locks, right? Right here. One, two, three. Okay. So it, it shows you what's locked so far. And I come back over here. It's going to attempt to run an exit. My guess, my guess is that this will auto roll back because it didn't, you didn't get to the commit the way you wanted to. Oh, roll back. Andy LeCates is gone. It's toast. Yeah. So that did. So unless you get to the commit, it doesn't count. This is a script to exit for some reason. The application to quit or crashes. If for any reason it doesn't get to the commit at the end, it's not going to happen. It's kind of an essential thing, right? It's an essential concept, right? It's kind of like concrete. It's like in American football, you got to kick that ball between the two uprights, right? And in, in, in soccer or European football, you got to put that ball in the box. And if it's not through the box, concrete, the back of the net, as they say, it don't count. And so that's how that is. If you only go halfway there, it doesn't count. Okay, uh, question. Do your variables get set within transactions and persist or the transaction fails? The variables have uh, nothing to do with it because variables aren't committed, right? Kind of like global fields. They're not, they're not something that's regulated by a commit. Therefore, they're not real, right? So they, they, are, they live outside the space-time continuum. Right, they don't live inside that world. Yeah, Globals like don't live in the world, and variables don't live in the world. Says that variables should be scoped to the script, not the transaction. But please confirm. Uh, Andy wants me to confirm it. Okay, scenario seven. No problem. That's what we do. Where Andy and I are both kind of like <laughs> learning this. You know, we play with this, but really deeply understanding it. Most of our day jobs aren't coding all day. Uh, do variables get saved or die question mark okay scenario okay open again we create andy 
Then we're going to, let's see, go to record page four. I'm just going to, I don't really care about that one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say set variable. Now, remember, a local variable would die anyway. So that's not a good example. So we need to use uh, variable doggy. Okay. Uh, we'll be set to bow wow. All right. Very sophisticated. Okay. Doggy bow wow. Okay. Then what we'll do is we will cause it to fail right here because I will give it a revert command. You guys haven't watched me do the revert command. Check. This is kind of cool. Check. Oop, that's it. Check out the options here. You got the condition of which it'll revert. Okay. If in my case, one equals one, I always do one equals one. I think somebody just put one, but in my mind, one is not an equation. One is not an equation. One equals one is an equation, right? Right. I don't do like the shortcuts. A lot of the advanced developers do that. My hurts my hurts my head. Error code could be uh if I give it an error code outside of the allowed range, it will ignore me. Okay. And then if I do this message, I'll just put doggy bow wow or just put doggy, doggy fifty fifty five. It's gonna ignore those because those are not it'll still revert, but it's ignore. That code is ignore that message. I found this out a little while ago. So it's going to run down here. It'll set this. We'll see it set it. I'll put the data viewer up. And then it will continue to set even though we reverted down here, right? Uh, I'll just say set. I'll do something else so it doesn't just exit. Set uh, variable dollar dollar uh, kitty. Right? Meow. All right, there we go. That's for Brutterman. All right, save it. All right, here comes the scenario. One, two, three. Come over here. I'm going to, is Andy in here? No, nope, Andy's not in here. I just have a bunch of data on Samantha. Let me clean that up. Da, 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 da. Clean that. Come over here, run the locky release thingy. So that's going to check that. It's all good. Okay, stand by. Script debugger on. Data viewer on. Over here. Okay, and, and run do variables get set or die. Okay. Come down, come down, come down, come down. New record, Andy. Bam, bam, bam. Edit the first record. Bam. -o. Okay. Here we go. Whoa. Wait, wait, what happened? The variable wasn't set before the exit script. It's it Andy's fault. Exited before the variable. See? Oh, damn it. <laughs> <sighs> sorry. 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 I wanted to do the revert anyway. Sorry. My bad. That was a leftover from the previous demo. All right, try that again. Play. Here we go. Ding, 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 ding. Andy, Andy, Andy. Bold red one set. Right? Basically, the Samantha bold red one. Okay. We set the variable step. Uh, current. Doggy is bow. Ah, oh, that was. <laughs> well, it's set right there. I'm just going to have it play in a board. I need to hang on one more second. It's not the most conclusive demo that ever lived. So I'm going to set the variable outside of here to fish. Random word in my head. There we go. Fish. Save. All right. Set it again. There we go. Bam, 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 bam. Now I got fish over here. Dog equals fish. It was set, right? Yes. Okay. Step down. Step down. Set, 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 set. Set bow wow, bow wow. Okay, step down. It reverted, it's exiting. Okay, it's gonna exit, exit. Now it hasn't run this command yet. It's the next command that'll run. What's the status? Bow wow, bow wow is preserved. And then of course I can set it after that. So once again, variables, and I'm pretty sure global fields exist out, outside of the space time continuum as far as transactions are concerned. Andy says it's good. Oh, it's already two o'clock. We're having so much fun. Um, I even forgot how time flies. All right. So uh, we've got one question from Twitch that I'll grab before we poof away. Yeah. Uh, how do you insert user activity into this scenario? You don't. Okay. We want to know what the guy did. This is what the guy did. This guy, Micah, his name is a very smart developer. What he did is he created a script that got you to your spot with an open transaction and inside the transaction it starts looping and it's looking for uh, a condition to change. So the script is constantly churning like a washing machine going rah, 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 around the circle, waiting for you to do something. Okay. 
And then if you do something and it sees you do something, then the script allows it to get out of that loop and to continue to finish the commit. Okay. I would rather go to the dentist and have my teeth uh, fix the cavity, fix, drill my tooth out and fix the cavity than do that. Okay. But this guy's, I mean, some of you are really talented. You could do that. But I, why? Why? Okay. If you need the trap for user interaction and say, like, we didn't want them to do any information on here, you would go to layout mode. You would create global fields, all the global fields, so nothing saved. And then when you want for them to save, you put a save button at the bottom. And then it, once you that it runs that script, that script would open a transaction, then do a bunch of set fields from your global set, 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 set from your globals, set, 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 commit transaction, problem solved. Is it work? Yes, because you have to set up a field with a bunch of globals on it. But it is what is available today which is more than what was available last week. NJ from Australia says, I think this has some great uses. Yeah, I agree. I think it's great. I, I think I'm covering the basics here for all of you. Some of you are really advanced people. NJ is one of the people advanced, you know, the typical uh, suspects. Like Monkey Bread is pretty hot to trot. Uh, you've got, uh, uh, what's his name in there? Who would, uh, Kyle would do this kind of stuff. Kyle would find, you know, you know, unnatural things to do with a, uh, uh, transaction, right? What I would call that, right? Um, but yeah, pretty neat. Pretty neat, pretty neat, pretty neat. Yep. Any other questions? I think it's good when a script opens many tables and fails and we'll roll back chain table. Yeah, that's the whole point, David. Uh, once again, you can revert, manual revert, or it'll auto abort. Auto abort. Watch Claire's change the name of the auto abort thing. Other questions? I'm, I got nothing to do for five, 10 minutes. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Today, I'm slow lots. Thanks. Yeah, well, we can pick this up next week if you want. But if you have something you want us to demo, you need to shoot me an email so I have time to prep. This demo took a little bit of doing. I first, this actually getting the damn uh, green things to, to light up and indicate <laughs> was tricky because, yeah, it's tricky, a little tricky. So, yeah. Um, could you set the layout to not automatically save to simulate this for manual use? I'm not sure when to use that feature. I, you know, some of my, you can have auto save at the, on layout mode, which I always turn on. I always turn auto save on, on all the time because I never want people thinking about when to save their stuff. Uh, besides I learned FileMaker back in the day when there was no, it only auto save. There was only auto. There was nothing else. So once again, it's what you're used to. I guess you could, my, I, I should, and my general impression is that if you're trying to control your user to do something specific, you want to explicitly control them because they'll find a way of screwing. It's like validations. If you want to validate data in FileMaker, do not use the field level validation on defined fields. Don't come in here and come in here and go validation, set validations up. This sucks. This is old school. This is really horrible, and it's hard to control. If you want a validation, you have someone input some data into a field or even a global then you run a script trigger, or whatever you need to do on exit of that field or on modification. It runs a script that validates it. That way you have precise control of when it runs. Whenever you do the auto save on or off, I'm just concerned about all the little weird intangibles, right? Because people set this up right here and they have no idea how this will affect their lives in terms of scripts being interrupted, in terms of imports being interrupted, in terms of whatever, right? And so... If you write it into a script, you precisely control when it's going to do what it's going to do. Does that make sense? So it's it's kind of this from beginner to intermediate step. But when we move people, we take everything that's FileMaker like in like a validation or something like that, or even potentially an auto enter sometimes. We remove it and we put it into scripts so we can precisely control when it fires because we control when scripts operate. That's our domain. We have total, you have total control. It's like, was watching the Empire Strikes Back and and uh, Lord Vader was choking people out when they kept screwing up. And so you have total control. Choke out FileMaker. You want to do what you want it to do. You don't want it operating automatically behind your back. Right? That's it's it'll do that, right? So that's my thought on that. I once again yeah, it's the uh, does this require <laughs> server and desktop FM version parity. Claris, okay, so we talked about this briefly yesterday. Claris incorporated decided to ship to show their commitment to the filemaker platform it was subtle they didn't say it i'm saying it more verbosely 
they decided that this was to demonstrate that they're still committed to FileMaker kind of first and foremost. They released these updates for the FileMaker platform first. They will come out on the Clarish platform soon. The transaction thing will be in there. Complete parity with that. I think you might have also been asking, do you need FM 16 or not 16, 19.6 server and a 19.6 pro to do it? Well, you definitely need 19.6 uh, pro to do it. Um, my guess is you probably need server because a server, I haven't tested it against it, honestly. And I haven't seen where it says that in there one way or the other. You'd have to test it. Um, obviously, you could have someone using a older version of pro and someone using a newer version of Pro, and you would be okay, right? Um, I think if you want to use transactions, you might want to use the latest server. I wouldn't want to do it without that. Because here's the thing. You could also send a transaction to PSOS, and PSOS does a transaction for you. But if you try to PSOS a transaction with older server, it won't know what to do. At the same time, I wouldn't install 19.6 server in production just yet. It's brand new. We don't even have it in production. I have a, two test servers on it. Right. So I know this is cool, but keep in mind, people are going to overuse this. They're going to put everything in a transaction and there's no point in doing that for a vast majority of things. Only things that really someone's going to get fired or money's going to be lost or something like that. That's when you want to run transactions. If you just have some random note that you've sent Jenny a PDF with the latest product price list on it. That's not transaction worthy. I guess you could do it if you're bored, right? A lot of people see a shiny tool and they use it just because. So anyway. All right. Did, did you show the last scenario, scenario four? Yeah. Well, I didn't really show it because it uh, kind of sucks. I, I did kind of indirectly. I mean, let's go ahead and do it. Um, so no records locked there. No records locked here. Script. Uh, well, mm, I'm going to run it without the script debugger. What this is going to do. Well, let me show you the script real quick. Um, scenario four, it's going to execute, um, a giant pause in the middle is all it does. It doesn't do anything else. Okay. Uh, because if you halt the script, it exits, right? Right, right. If you exit, if you, if the script, if the script quits running, we just demonstrate that you can't just put an exit on it and then pick it up later. The script has to keep running. If it, if it, if the script terminates, it rolls back the 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 transaction. I demoed that. So we're going to come over here and run it. So now I'm in a pause state. I've got no control up here at the top. It's it's really restricted. The pause on this, I think this pause, if I had to guess, is a little... Now, can I edit over here? Yeah, there were some issues with this. Um, you got to watch out for that. I'm going to hit continue. So it's Daniel Grant, and I hit continue. Okay, so as long as I didn't have to go anywhere, right, and run absolutely no scripts, I got away with it. The problem is, is that you're going to hit the wall with this pretty quickly. If I run it again, I try to – if if I run any script, right, like if I try to run – like if I – like I go Samantha and I just – I go back to – I just put it Sam, right? And I click out of here and then I do something else. Yeah, see, it, it aborted the it had aborted the script, the first script. If I go to script debugger, I doubt think you're gonna see the script stacked up. Finish. Will it come back to the other one? No, it doesn't. It canceled it out. So um basically, um people far smarter than this determined that this wasn't gonna work. And I'm not gonna try to make it work for you when they all people smarter than me said that you're screwed and it won't work. So um it's basically very, very limited because you'd have to not trip any scripts anywhere. No triggers, no nothing. Because if you trip a script, it aborts that previous, the previous open and the previous commit. Okay. What happens? Another script calls another script at the transaction. Um, it'll roll that in there. Um, so you can call subscripts. You can call subscripts. Absolutely, David, you can call subscripts. So you could call inside the, the goalpost between the open and the commit. Do you call another script? Okay. But the rules that regulate it are the same as the rules that regulate here is that um, you can't change windows. You can't terminate the script. Um, you know, all the rules still apply, but you could run subscripts. And if it errors out over there, like it hits the auto abort in a subscript, it'll come back and down here, it'll tell you that. It's very cool. So, yeah, subscripts are allowed. Stay on the same window.
okay? Or the card if you're on the card, okay? And if you cause the script to terminate or it runs into an unsavory condition where it can't proceed, it will auto abort. Looks to me like running a script when pause inside a script still worked. It worked still only in so much as that I never did anything of value there that was important. If I only edited the four or five fields that were here, I think it was okay. But if I inadvertently trigger the you and user, there's say use script triggers. If you never use script triggers, you never go anywhere. But I use script triggers in a lot of places to do things. If you step, like I have a script on here that might be like my little, uh, you see my sweeper scripts and starting point that cleans the, that cleans the texting in there. I say I'm typing in here and I paste and then it's like, oh, this is size, you know, it's like, Size 85, and I want to reset that. And I run the little sweeper script over here. Pow, you just killed yourself. So it's pretty limited, right? You can't do audit trails. You can't do anything, right? So the script has to be paused, and you can't do anything exciting while it's paused. I don't script see script session. Yes, David. It's an on 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 a per not layout per window, and not, it's open transaction on a per window and per. Uh, per window and per script session, I think is really what the two limits there, right? Not per layout, per window, okay? Because I, I changed layouts in the one demo, uh, demo, go to another layout, come back. Yeah, that's supported. So yeah, it's not layout independent. It's window specific. All right, cool. Well, that's it. It's a very exciting day. It went right by today. I'm actually enjoying myself because I, I didn't realize that we just spent an hour and 15 minutes banging away on this. If you all end up having more questions about transactions or want to see things, you can bother us about that before. Yeah, send an email to support at RC Consulting. Send email to support at RC Consulting. We'll be happy to talk about that. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. Biomaker license. Uh, well, it's potentially expired. Look at the back of that car right there. Looks like the Biomaker license has expired. Sir, I need you to step out of the vehicle. Sir, sir, step out of the vehicle. Sir.